Hi, I'm Zach Maffe here with Dr. Ed Kim. Today we're going to give you an overview of chest trauma. And the golden objective is to kind of uh, talk a little bit about what your preconceived ideas are about trauma. Ident identify and recognize the two common classes of traumatic injury which we use to organize our thoughts and think about how people die from their injuries and, uh, and then discuss all of this in the setting of or in the context of chest trauma. These two images sort of depict our common notions about trauma. On the left, gunshots, and in that category we put stab wounds and other penetrating injury, and on the right, car crashes, and then also think about other forms of blunt injury. Right, these are two common you know, images that we see all the time, right, in, in our society and in, Amer in America. And these two lead to two distinct patterns of injury. And we'll change uh, categorizing patients in this way. We'll help you think about the different patterns of injuries that these patients are likely to present with. Right. Something that smashes, breaks things, may injure different things versus something that penetrates and, and cuts through in a more focused manner, right? And so how do people die from their injuries? Well, well what do you think people think? People who want doctors. I think that people think people die from bleeding, which is true. People do die from bleeding, mm -hmm. but you have to think about more than just bleeding when you think about a trauma patient. What, so, because uh, we have to prioritize what actually kills the patient immediately right. versus what ultimately is the source or the cause of the kill, exactly. what kills them, right? And oftentimes the thing that will actually kill the patient first is losing their airway or having uh, respiratory compromise before the actual circulatory shock will kill them, which uh, we'll get into in a future lecture right. about how trauma surgeons prioritize the ABCs of right. trauma. People get into shock, they lose their consciousness because they, they don't get enough blood to their brain and then they lose their airway. Great. And I think the other major concept we're going to try to introduce here to help you organize and remember these injuries, right, instead of them remembering them as like uh, random facts, is to mm -hmm. think of the body as a piece of engineering. So think of it as be a structural engineer. You know, like the bridge. What are your weak points? What's likely to break? What are the strong points? What kind of force will cause something to cause problems, right? And then, well, let's apply that to the chest, Zach. And I think that's uh, really important because it's not just about what's on the inside. You have to under understand the anatomy on the inside, not just about what happened to the outside in mm -hmm. order to get a sense of what's going on with a patient. So I think it's important to review your anatomy, right? Yeah. Of course, always. And then I think it's important to think about what actually happens on the inside. This right. is like a concrete picture. So this is a great photo because, you know, say this gentleman fell, uh, you know, on his side, on his side yeah. or yeah. got in a car crash. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, he's playing, oh, my chest hurts. Well, you might think he's got some broken ribs, which clearly he does. But you have to think to yourself, what else is going on? If a patient presents with broken ribs, you need to also assume he's going to have injuries to those structures right underneath the ribs. Because right. trauma and you have to know dynamic. the anatomy, right? You have to know the anatomy yeah. what's underneath the ribs. You have ribs. to understand yeah. that the lung's right there, the pleura's there, yeah. there's blood vessels, and yeah. those are also at risk for being injured. Right, so let's talk about what's most vulnerable in the chest. And I, li I, I like to think of it as peripheral versus central. So, I think that's, uh, that's a nice way of thinking about it. If you think about uh, how the chest is organized, you have your, your ribs, and then centrally you have your sternum. So your ribs are, although they protect the lungs, they're more vulnerable than say your sternum, which is a full solid piece of bone that protects your heart. And the heart is more centrally located, so it's harder to reach and be injured. Okay, and we'll talk about penetrating versus blunt a little later. But let's quickly go over the uh, scan on the right. So what do you see? So on this scan here, I see, you know, the left lung on the, uh, looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. But on the right, you see, a lot of empty space where that P is, so that's black, so that's air, so that's uh -huh. a pneumothorax, or uh -huh. air in the chest. Then you see a little collapsed lung uh, that's all compressed, and then underneath it, that bright stuff is actually blood, so that's hemothorax, where and the you, H is. And you can also see the uh, subcute emphysema. So can you briefly narrate or, or, or create a pic, like a history of what actually happened? And so let's say this patient was in a car accident. He, uh, the ribs broke on impact, and when they broke, they are sharp. So the edges of the ribs are pointy and those pushed inwards and probably lacerated his lung, causing bleeding, unsurprisingly, but also causing air to leak out from the lung into the thoracic space. Excellent. So if you do have a pneumothorax, right? And you know, and let's say you lose a whole side of a lung, I mean, does that cause immediate life-threatening problems with 
breathing, ventilation, oxygenation? Well, the, you know, we have a lot of physiologic reserve. In fact, there are people who could live off one normal lung. Uh, so in a simple pneumothorax, although the patient might have increased work of breathing and maybe some decrease in oxygen saturation, uh, a simple pneumothorax in the average patient probably won't kill them. At However, least not right away. It could uh, if left untreated. Yeah. as we can see what will happen next. Okay, and the chest x-ray shows a big pneumothorax. Yeah. yeah, so looking on the right there, you notice that there's a lot of lucency on the right chest compared no, to the left. No markings. No, no lung markings, yeah. but you do see a little nubbin of, of lung on the right of the heart, which is the lung completely yeah. collapsed down. That's pretty impressive. That's it. And, well, and this chest x-ray actually is not a traumatic chest x-ray. It's a post-op chest x-ray, somebody with bad atelectasis and, and uh, uh, plugging. And this is just to uh, point out what you just talked about, that people have a lot of reserve. This patient did not need to be intubated. They got some respiratory therapy over the course of two days, and they did okay. But let's go to what you were no, uh, kind of hinting about how people can have a serious problem with the pneumothorax. Right, so this is the most feared complication of a, of a simple pneumothorax becoming what we call a tension pneumothorax. The tension being the increased pressure causing the mediastinal structures to shift, and with that increased positive pressure inside the thoracic cavity, which is not physiologic, you can get compression of venous return to the heart uh, directly on the SVC and the IVC. And anytime you cut off blood flow to the heart, you decrease your cardiac output and essentially get right. an obstructive cardiac collapse and shock. Right. So uh, physical exam findings that are classic? So physical exam findings, well, you have distended neck veins. Uh -huh. Your trachea will be deviated away yeah. from the side of the pneumothorax. Um, and you will have shock. Okay, great. And I think it's important to point out the one-way valve mechanism, right? The air goes out, but it yeah. out of the lung, but it can't go back in. Okay. Great. So now, how do we manage uh, a hole in the lung, a pneumothorax? Well, well how it, so you know, the, your first instinct might be to think, well, we need to close the hole. We need to need to sew. Right. It. For a layperson, any lay injury, person. we always think about sutures, so we're, stitches. We're, we're, we're smarter than that here at UCSF. We know that that's not necessarily how everything works, and the lung is a very fragile, friable tissue. And you know, doing a big open surgery to clo close off a small hole might not really be the right answer here. And in fact, it's not. Most pneumothoraxes are managed by actually putting a tube into the chest and uh, sucking on that tube to re-expand the lung. That's called putting in a chest tube, uh -huh. which uh, restores the natural physiology of the lung and creates a tamponade effect by re-expanding the lung against the chest wall. So how do we take care of the hole then? Well, the hole will just seal itself, actually, in most cases. Um, so you're saying the body will heal itself. The body will heal itself. Amazing. It's a beautiful thing. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. And what about this uh, needle uh, on the right? Well, needle on the right, that's an angio, uh, angio catheter, which can be IV. used yeah. in yeah. emergency situations. If a patient presents with a tension pneumothorax, what you need to do is relieve that tension in any way possible. So you can put this in the second, uh, second intercostal space at the anterior axillary line. And that'll create a hole, so communication between the pleural space and air, and decompress. Oh, mid-clavicular second rib, and then mid-axillary or mid-axillary mid fifth rib. Okay, yeah. great. And, and we actually know residents who actually carry Andrecath in their pockets, so that perhaps they can be, they can you know, save somebody's life yeah. out on the street if if they run into some kind of trauma, right? Okay, now let's go to bleeding. Well, bleeding. Uh, so you know, we talked about bleeding as a cause of mortality and morbidity, of course. Uh, and you got to think about, you know, what are the major causes of bleeding? You know, what is bleeding? Is it going to be your little vessels in the lung or bigger vessels in the chest wall or even, you know, the you heart from the yeah. heart yeah. or the aorta or so the I think, IVC? Yeah, I think it's important, again, to review the anatomy and see what the vessels are and what the, what, how the vessels, uh, you know, relate. And on the scan here, you can see a big left hemothorax. Uh, but there is one type of bleeding that we all need to be uh, concerned about, which isn't common, but it's a classic case of uh, engineering or, or yeah. uh, seeing the body as a structural uh, so, so a structure. So this is showing a person getting in a head-on car accident, and as uh, Dr. Kim will tell you, this is a deceleration type injury. And the heart, if you think about the heart, it's 
essentially not exactly free floating, but it can move independently in the chest. Yeah, the uh, arch cage. can move back and forth, and the, right? And the aortic arch as well. But the descending aorta, as you know, is a retroperitoneal structure, so it's fixed. So with a deceleration, the heart and arch will move forward and can potentially avulse or tear uh, away from the so descending the, aorta. The descending aorta is hold still. The arch is still moving, and then you got your tear. Yeah, tear. And w and what would you see if that was the case? Well, uh, you'd see most you, of them would die. Most yeah. of these patients may die in the field if you have a major transection. Yeah. But if the rupture is contained in the retroperitoneum, you might see something like this on the chest X-ray, which you know the key find would be you know wide and mediastinum or a pleural cap, which we don't see cap. here. And and, and what is what is that? Physically, what does that represent? That represents the hematoma building up around the aorta. So the clot. Okay. The clot. All right. Okay, so now let's talk about, go back a little bit. We're going to talk about the aortic injury also, but, but what about just generally blood bleeding in the chest? How do, what's the good approach? Right. So we talked about Sewing air it? in the chest, and we talked about how we don't sew for air in the chest. But for bleeding in the chest, you might think, oh, well, bleeding, we should definitely sew this up. But actually, it turns out that um, that might not be your best first move, especially if the patient is you know, relatively stable. The first move might be to get the blood out of the chest and re-expand the lung, just like we talked about with the pneumothorax. So how does the re-expanding the lung itself stop bleeding, Zach? That's a great, a great point. You know, the bleeding, if the bleeding is from the lung or if it's... Uh, I mean, the parenchymal vessels. Parenchymal, yeah. That's going to be a low-pressure system. It's your right heart. Or if it's a small other source of bleeding, maybe just re-expanding the lung and giving it a little time will cause it to tamponade and seal off. Again, the body can heal itself. As, nice. Okay. As we know. And what are the blood vessels that you don't think would? So major, you know, major pulmonary blood vessels probably not going to seal off by themselves. And then anything that's under systemic pressure is less likely to seal off itself. So that would be your intercostal arteries. Okay. And how do you know whether you need to go and sew something? <laughs> well, usually the general rule of thumb would be a patient who loses more than a liter of blood or a thousand cc's when you put the tube in or 200 cc's an hour for the first two to four hours. Okay, great. And on the picture on the right shows a thoracotomy that would be uh, necessary, yeah, right? Emergent situations. Yeah. And then for the aortic injury, you can actually do endovascular repair, which has been a great uh, uh, advance. Okay, let's round out the blunt injuries with the flail chest. What do you see on the chest x-ray so here? So this is uh, an x-ray showing multiple rib fractures in multiple locations on the right, and then you see the lung is very opacified, so that's probably a big pulmonary contusion. Oh. And a flail chest is basically where you don't have the normal physiology of breathing. So you need to have a fixed rib cage in order to generate that negative pressure. Otherwise, if you generate negative pressure, then the rib cage is just going to collapse in. Right. And that's going to compromise the same physio breathing. Yeah, and the same physiology is for open pneumothorax. But in real, in clinical uh, setting, it's actually not that common that we see, you know, physiologic ventilatory compromise that's significant because of either of these. Okay. Uh, but we do see things like pulmonary contusion, underlying flail chest, which tends to be more of a problem. And what about cardiac contusion? Well, you know, similarly to if you get a rib fracture, you should look for pulmonary contusions. If you have major injury to the, to the chest, uh, like a sternal fracture or another mechanism you're worried about, you have to think about a cardiac contusion because that, you know, the heart is right behind the sternum. So these people are going to have chest pain. These people are going to have chest pain, and then you want to look for arrhythmias on their EKG uh, to make you suspicious, and okay. then you'd work that up with an echo. Okay, great. Like an observation. And most people do fine, even if they have cardiac contusion, but yeah. just uh, conservative management, right? Okay, now let's uh, finish things up with uh, penetrating trauma. So I would say penetrating trauma on the periphery are pretty much the same, but what's the main difference, would well, you say? The main difference, you know, obviously in the chest, you, you worry about, you know, major injury to the mediastinal structures or major pulmonary blood vessels. So they're not anatomical? Not anatomical. So, so any, every, every, anything is a go? Anything is a go. And you, people, if they're trying to kill you, they're going to try to go for the heart. And just because yeah. someone might be shot on yeah. the, you know, yeah. their left side of the chest doesn't mean that bullet didn't go all the way through their heart to the other side of the chest. See. Yeah. So you have to have a high index. System. So gunshot wound, stab wounds, two different. So that's a subclassification mm -hmm. of the penetrating trauma. Is that That's correct? Well, that is. Okay. Great. And then the main uh, entity that we always need to talk about is cardiac tamponade right. with penetrating trauma, right? And so, so how does the subclassification of gunshot wound and stab wound So if you've got gunshot wound, that's a very high energy and it's going to cause a lot of destruction to the tissue. So if you get shot in the heart, for example, it's going to destroy the you know, pericardium. Do people make it? A lot of these people will not make it to the hospital. And uh, these people are going to be have massive bleeding from their heart right. versus a stab wound where 
it might, if the patient's lucky, just be a, a smaller wound to the heart, but uh, the pericardium might not be open. It might just be sealed It often off. seals like, up again, And then right? you yeah. can get buildup of blood around the heart, which causes obstructive shock, like we talked about with the tension hemothorax. Great. And uh, diagnosis and treatment? So, you know, diagnosis would be your physical exam findings. Of, okay. uh, and a stab wound in the chest. A stab right? wound in the chest with yeah. the right clinical scenario. And then the treatment, you'd have to decompress the heart. Uh, if the patient's stable, you might do a pericardial window. But if they're crashing and unstable, then they're going to get a thoracotomy. And uh, that way, they're going to decompress the heart that way. Right. And I would say, uh, just thinking about the mechanism, I mean, I think the pericardium would still be torn. But more likely, when you're bleeding, it creates a little clot. And mm. it probably closes yeah, it, it off, right? Off. Exactly, okay. yeah. All right. So uh, in summary, I think it's important to point out that there are two distinct mechanisms of injury. Uh, that cause patterns or uh, typical patterns and then it's important to think about the body as the anat I guess the anatomy is really the key to understand the injury mm -hmm. right like everything and then that way you're able to understand it through narratives and, and you know concrete events that you can understand and remember rather than uh, you know random facts and then to consider the pathophysiology behind these injuries or these derangements and anatomy that occur with trauma okay and you would say the the main things that end up killing people on chest trauma would be what tension pneumo tension pneumothorax cardiac, cardiac tamponade and bleeding aortic uh, injury okay yeah. great thank you very much for listening and uh next up will be the um abdominal trauma <laughs>